Good evening, and what a great turnout. Um, we're so happy to see all of you here, and we are super excited um, for the readings this evening with our executive director, Hank Hine, and also... <laughs> And also with fellow trustee, um, Jeff Goodby, all the way from San Francisco. Welcome to that. I see many fellow board members in the audience. Thank you all for coming. I see lots of writers, lots of poets. Um, we love having you guys come. Um, and fiction and prose writers too. But um, we, we really welcome all of you and it means a lot to have you here. So thank you and I know that you don't want to miss it because I think what Hank and Jeff are gonna do will be so much fun. It's gonna be a really fun evening um, and uh, full of surprises, doing things a little differently than we normally do, those of you who come back um, every month. So it'll be fun. Um, I want to just say a couple things. First of all, it's especially I'm especially excited to be able to have them read their work because for the longest time I've been saying to Hank, you know, we all know you're a poet, um, and yet we haven't been able to talk him into getting up here to read his own poems, and yet he's been so behind the Dolly Poetry Series, he's been so supportive. Um, you know, t for this program, for all of you guys who come to hear the program, it's a, it's a big thank you to, um, you know, that I feel toward Hank, and um, I know you guys do too. I just want to say thank you to him for his support of the program and for being um, a, a terrific poet. He's published four books of poetry. Okay, we've got to talk about that, Hank. I didn't even know there were so many. But thank you for your support of poetry. I also want to thank um, our sponsors. We have AARP, Yvonne, I think I saw you, if you're... I think she leaving. left. Oh, okay. I, I'm, <laughs> I think I'm she just counting the staff members um, that are leaving as they yeah. go out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you to Yvonne, but also AARP for supporting our program and to the city of St. Petersburg. You guys have been great. Uh, we're going on our fourth year now. Um, and um, Thank you. And many of you who come every, every month are, are uh, loyal supporters of the program. So thank you for that. Uh, so we're going to do it a little bit differently tonight. I will start out with a short poem um, per protocol. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to introduce um, both Jeff and Hank. And you'll see that they're going to kind of read back and forth their beautiful book. Um, and they've brought copies to show you, and I have my own. And it really is exquisite. And I hope you'll be able to come up after the program and look through it. Um, see the attention, the beauty, touch the paper, well, can they touch the paper? <laughs> touch <Please>. the paper, <laughs> carefully. Um, um, you know, it's, it's just really an exquisite work of art. And I mean, any poetry book is exciting, but a poetry book with this level of detail and um, attention is, is truly a gift for those of us who love poetry. So, um, so in a few minutes, I'll um, introduce each of them. But first, I'm going to read a short poem. Um, and, and so th this is an experiment, um, right? So, so this is trying to embrace Dadaism and surrealism. This is truly an experiment. This is a poem, some of you guys may have heard of The Golden Shovel. Um, that a poet by the name of Terence Hayes invented this form. He actually did it as an homage to Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, and it's a deal where he took, he, you take a poem and you take the, um, all, the, all the words in a single line and those words become the last word in each of the lines of the poem that you create. So you use another poet's words to create your poem. Um, so I've sort of tried that here, but I, then I introduced a few other things. Um, I also found Andre Breton kept entering this poem, um, the famous surrealist, and if you haven't seen the wonderful exhibit, um, you need to go see it, it's fabulous. So he also enters this poem, and this poem started as an exquisite corpse. So it's, you know, just fraught with all kinds of surrealism stuff going on. Um, the title of the poem is called, Andre Breton Joins the Conversation. And his quotes are added to the end words from Hank and Jeff's April 14th poem. Mm. Wow. Andre Breton joins the conversation, insisting words make love with one another which feels generally true when I think how meaning is created 
whether we intend it or not. Around us, a fevered world is cracking, particular and gaunt, while we, clueless, rub two sticks together, crouching in the dark. Heat is a voice that won't stop humming beneath a requiem of ice. Everywhere, a drowned shore heaving. Listen, it calls and calls again. Desire, like a child's burned finger, still prodding the fire with a stick. I am the soul in limbo, says Breton. And words make love with one another. We in our pale linen shrouds. In linen, our love goes on forever. What more will come undone before the sun spirals back to that first spark? the one that flung us wide-eyed and gasping toward some frozen land. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it, I think at some point that became a poem also about global warming. It kind of hijacked <laughs> on <it> too. <laughs> yeah, and, and there were a few images um, from their poem, um, actually in the poem as well. All right, so Jeff grew up in Rhode Island and graduated from Harvard, where he wrote for the Harvard Lampoon. He worked as a newspaper reporter in Boston, and his illustrations have been published in Time, Mother Jones, and Harvard Magazine. He began his advertising career at J. Walter Thompson and was lucky enough to meet the legendary Hal Riney, whom he still thinks of as his mentor. It was with Riney that, Go that Goodby earned, learned his reverence for surprise, humor, craft, and restraint. He also met a guy named Rich Silverstein, and they founded GS&P in 1983. Since then, the two have won just about every advertising award imaginable. Two commercials he directed were selected to be among the top 30 advertising films of the 1990s by one club. Is that the Got Milk and also Dream Further, those two? I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. One, those are some we all know. Um, in 2006, he was inducted into the Advertising Hall of Fame. He lives in Oakland, California with his family, a dog, a cat, three horses, and probably some other things he doesn't know about. <laughs> 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 and Hank Hine, whom, of course, you all know, um, but you might not know everything about him. Um, as executive director of the Dolly Museum, he leads the preeminent and most visited art museum in the Southeast. During his tenure, the Dalis created exhibitions and classroom opportunities for the education and delight of a local, national, and global audience. Exhibitions made in partnership with other international museums have raised the profile of Dali's art and contextualized his role in the modern era, bringing increased understanding of Dali, surrealism, and the power of art to enhance the human condition. As founder and co-director of the Dolly Museum Innovation Labs, Hein has fused the science of creative problem solving with the transformational experience of visual art to expand individual and corporate capabilities in diverse pursuits. He has extensive experience with contemporary artists and writers in the intersection of media and the current cultural milieu. Dr. Hein's publications including the four books of poetry, um, include text and image relationships and intellectual history. Please welcome both Jeff and Hank. And listen as they delight us by reading their collaborative effort together. Should we stand up? Should we talk a little bit? Have it. I think we should. What was so like I wanted to about? talk about how we met. You know, I bet people wonder about that. And um, I, I, I actually met Hank through uh, our kids. And uh, my son was going on a field trip, and I ended up talking to his then wife about what was going on with her husband. And she said, Oh, he's a, he's a printmaker. Well, nobody's a printmaker. <laughs> you know. And, uh, him. And I, so I said, wow, that's amazing. I'd love to meet him, you know. And um, so I went to his, uh, his studio at the time, Limestone Press, and um, he proceeded to try to sell me a whole bunch of prints. 
which I didn't buy, but uh, we started talking about this, this um, shared love for this form. And, um, and, I, and I think we both have you know, deeply appreciated printing throughout our lives. And that's, you know, it's a tribute to Hank that he figured out how to print this thing in his garage. And, you know, it was a wonderful experience doing so. Um, he'll tell you a little bit about the form of this thing. It is, uh, I can, if I can jump ahead, it is, it is actually a poetry rango, which is kind of like one poet writes something, sends it to the other person each day, the other person has to answer it. And it was something that we sort of promised ourselves we would do. And finally, after, after years and years, we grounded <laughs> doing it for one month. Um, <laughs> so we, 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 we've started other ones, but this one actually got finished and and, and, and that's the way it works, is one poet writes, the other poet answers, and we will read each other's work, and you won't really know who wrote what. Maybe you could talk about the book a bit. Well, the real story <laughs> of our meeting, I saw this guy at Burning Man. <laughs> and, uh, he said he uses Burning Man for everything he can't explain. <laughs> Uh, so I heard when Jeff and I met, I heard that he, uh, among the other things you do in advertising, is you make films. And I have always made little silly films, which I enjoy putting together. And so I wanted to see how, how he did it. Well, it turned out when he reciprocated the visit to my press, we went over to his place, it seemed like he had like 40 people working in, in very advanced ed, you know, editorial rooms. and. Uh, so it was not the level of technology that I uh, was hoping to see. Uh, and, and, you know, in terms of what one expects and what actually happens with this, we started sending these back and forth as we have for years. Um, but we were hitting a certain rhythm, a daily rhythm. And uh, I don't think we had the idea that this would be a collection until after it was all over and the energy dissipated a little bit. We exhausted awesome. after a month, so we decided yeah. that's a collection. <laughs> so uh, the, the poems actually start on the 1st of April, but they end on the 1st of May, which the book's called uh, Two Writers, 30 Days. So you can figure out that that isn't quite right. I think we missed a day in there. So um, that's how we went about it. and. Um, uh, we thought about bringing these to a publisher, but I, I love to keep my hands in art. Uh, much of what I do has to do, and much of what Jeff has to do with supervising and organizing what others do. And so I wanted to have my hands in this, and I found a great papermaker, um, and we talked about what uh, typeface, because we love typography, and, and we collaborated on the design of this thing, and then uh, I started printing it. It took a year to print. Um, you know, stealing a little time on a Saturday morning. I was there uh, for one day of it. Yes. <laughs> but it was fun. It was a good day. Yeah. Um, the process of printing is a wonderful thing at that stage because you have the thing finished and you can, you know, it's mostly about the technology of doing something over and over and repeating it, which is a very wonderful feeling. You don't have to, like, think anymore. You're not writing poetry. You're not making any more um, hand art. You're not... You're not thinking anymore. You're just making this thing over and over. It's a wonderful feeling, and I was lucky to share it in his garage with these presses that he has that are the size of cars. A couple of them. Um, they're ridiculous. Yeah. And and for that press, I have to thank Laura, who figured out that she could make all this fit in our garage. <laughs> and she doesn't need a car, it turned out. <laughs> She can walk to work. That, I say we've talked a lot about what we've done yeah. here. Let's give them a little taste of it and see if they like it. And, you know, there's people at the door to keep them from leaving. So. Especially the staff members, I understand. So, you know, there's two, there are two poems each day. And I'm going to read the first of the two poems because everything in life goes from left to right. So reading, train arrival so on. So this is March 31st. As if, you know, and one thing I wanted to stop and say is, 
Helen's a great reader of that stuff, and I'm going to be a, a, a bit shamed by her ability here. March 31st. As if I were a visitor from another planet, I noticed today that I say hello to birds. Those sweet creatures I have left in a world just like this one, unforgettable, cherished, lost. April 1st. I know what you're thinking. It has changed me to be a person from a tiny, it has changed me to be a person from a tiny state. My head turns when I hear it spoken, like the name of a lover, a haunted man alone on his misty rock, road Iceland. No man is eroded, as the poet assured us. That voice, that island, naming your home, is the voice constructing a fiction. Your state, is neither to belong or not belong, but attend and leave your mark as a man. Were you present or not present when she whispered your name? I like that one. April 2nd. Everything is wrapped in a plastic so indestructible, hermetically sealed like an island. I am set apart from everything I need, this bag of salad, this spoon that whispers, stir me, make me part of something to be served amid voices and light and a searing fire consumed utterly yet remembered always by a quiet, watchful little boy. Yet I fear such memory, fear not that it exists but its utility. Who does it serve? What good thing that we remember? We s who stood so close remembering the consuming fire, remember the consuming fire. And that boy, so quiet, still so quiet, the fire explains itself with fire and moves on. I woke thinking that this, that this was Good Friday, but at noon there was no mass at San Geronimo. Christ has a week's reprieve, it seems, or another week to wait for his glory, if we want to think of it like that. Let's think our end will be glorious. So what must we do this coming week to make it so? I couldn't help wondering what Jesus was going to do with his extra week, though with everlasting life, the pressure's off. <laughs> Turn some stones into loaves, make some fish from scratch, or just hang with the Maccabees until one by one, they crumble to the ground, fatally nicked by the pointy end of the minute hand. Don't want to be a dates? Maccabee, man. Huh? Do we give the dates so they get a sense of yeah, what, yeah, you know, how much more they have to... Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. You know what? I had painted over the date, and so I couldn't... Next one's April 4th. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see that things happened to these books. They were defaced by people. Pose to the oracle the age-old question, with gas or without gas, and see her vexation. Hmm, that's a hard one. It comes with and without. Life comes as does water. And life is like a fountain, the sage says, and not like a fountain. While it sparkles and laughs, yes, certainly, and love, Billie Holiday sings, is like a faucet. And you know what happens with faucets. But up on a hill, in every whistle-stop town, there is that relentless, tide-fresh summer, he laying her down and seeing the whole world in that place just below her ear, she whispering with, yes, with. A water joke. April 5th. What is the heart of heartlessness, she asked the endless sky. Where is the thing that will save us, the welcome rain that was good and, and could be again? Will the ice prevail? Does the sunset lie? I saw a dog in the blinding rain, swans bend and turn into a leveling wind. In the racing clouds, the ones who sinned pull tight a cloak of falling night and sip their pain. So we were working on a certain meter here that we wanted to replicate. Yeah, we did. She feels that righteous rage tear at the empty air. Only the weak think what is good can cause delight. I've seen more sunsets promise an unfailing light, 
their pinks falling to black, their light to nightmare. And what inconstant thing can justify our care to offer up this paltry native breath we share? April 6th. Everything will look like yesterday tomorrow. The tangled peelings of the thing not done, a love unspoken, the way the shadow crept up your sleeping face to a requiem of no one there. The rushing stream, the morning grass, gone, but for your holy candy in my pocket, proof that your hand did hold and cure. Mm. To find a proof in this undemonstrable world, this experiment with no control, traceless path of all affections, you lay just here and your legs were thus. Your head was on my pillow. I dried your hair as you slept. When you woke, I welcomed you to this impossible world. My only theorem, you, me, us. April 7th, edgers. They use small circular blades, edgers, you know. <laughs> they use small circular blades driven by a screaming gas motor on a long aluminum handle and they rip through grass and scar the pavement, drawing the boundary between lawn and lane. Purple in the gray, vermilion in the shadows on a cold, fine day, said Bonard, adjusting his hat. And in the Ardennes, a stand of oak shuddered the candelabra at their feet, all insisting this way, this way, until they reached the town where the border guard stubbed out his cigarette, pulled the rope, and sputteringly incised. April 8th. The guy who discovered titanium was a vicar, poking around the soil near his church. That much trammeled church and grounds still held something wonderful and unknown. Though the psalms had been sun, sung in the be beds along the stone walkways planted with roses for centuries. Look, he said, a skin of this will enable God's machines to fly faster and harder to the targets of his wrath. And in the distant scream of the ordinance, the uneasy children heard, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. April 9th. She called me in Neanderthal, but when she came from Africa, I'd already seen all, been all over Europe, places like Spain and Germany, saw the bison paintings, drank the beer. I had my own songs, my own, what you might call, adaptive strategies. I faced the light of the same world as she. Yes, we smoked fish with juniper bark and pine, and she was lovely in my firelight. Was I just short in the tibia, short on time, uninspired? She never spoke of our lovemaking. A future only sees the blood that lasts. She, with her light bones and high head, overwhelmed me. I thought she was a goddess, so little bound to this earth or me. But does she, in her clarity, know what we call compassion? When she is done, will she bury me with a necklace of flowers? We think we are playing the hand we are dealt but each card in our hand changes everyone else's. The less you show them, the more they will show you. The less you can read from them, the more they will see in you. She gives you a gift. Is that good? April 13th. There's a Portugal in my heart, a sun-bleached, encrusted place, abandoned, enslaved, and yet doors still open upon horses and dinner tables and you think you understood what the man just said. I think he said it was late, so late that all he is fondest of belongs to a former life, colonized by memory, still mined by the empire for its ore, the spices and exotic fruits exported at a quarter of their real cost. International trade explained. <laughs> April 14th. I have often wondered whether life moves from the particular to the general or from the general to the particular, from the burned fingers to heat, or from sun to campfire, from child to woman to desire, or from desire to just that, desire. I have often wondered whether love moves from particulars or from a general heat. The child by the campfire whose face is lit like yours. The woman for whom you burn, 
both lovely as the sun, I have often wondered where this light is from. So this one is inspired by uh, Horatio, um, a, a quote that Hank shared, and uh, we were both inspired by. Which of the gods now shall the people summon to prop Rome's reeling sovereignty? Issue of Jove's ma bleak majesty to welcome one more lax law to our policy. Now call back missiles, loosen our armor, feel the soft skin of children again. Praise to fair Venus for night's perfumed breezes, coin in the coffers of nations and men. We get inspired by it. Odd things here, you'll see. <laughs> April 15th, the invention of the apple. I forgot about the ordinary apple until recently. Heterozygotic, it doesn't replicate its traits exactly, but each new apple can be every apple. Crab or delicious, woody or sweet, it has the, it has the disposition for. So changeable, and a, ter a terrible problem for love. I, who tasted the apple, want continuity. I want the woman in the apple's sweetness too, not bitter issue. That woman who eats the whole fruit to the stem found it for me. Here, she said, this apple and its issue set wildly loose. Take and eat it, that a certain boy may cross the street and enter a rolling crowd, yet loom clearly visible for two city blocks until he looks briefly back and steps into the ankle deep waters of all who, were, all who will follow. So this is a Catullus poem, which is really lovely. If you like that guy, I quite like this guy. And, and the two lines that inspired this were, what more can life offer than the longed for, unlooked for event when it happens? Pretty lovely stuff. So we ripped him off. <laughs> <laughs> Except maybe the longed for event happening just when it is longed for. <laughs> The two of us up on opposite sides of the same door about to knock. Hey, Jeff, what uh, date are we in here? I'm glad you reminded me, Hank. We're on April 18th now. <laughs> that's, that's more than halfway through the month. Uh, like... you're, 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 you're trying to relieve them a bit. That we're more than halfway through. Yeah. Yeah. April 18th, body and soul, way too potent, this potion in two parts, linking thus so tightly grind and heart, resinous coupling given its start, with two clean surfaces prepared apart. A bond, it seems, so heavenly, allows no disparity. But what they bond and laminate is past to future, promising what I know and what I hope for, integrate there and last, do they? Does this glue, this wholeness, your love, makes of me hold true? Or is it merely a binary star, one body revolving around the other, eclipsing and wobbling its path, sometimes two in theory only, seemingly one, but only at this great remove? April 19th. Boundaries, a word with such currency in a world without bounds, except that perpetual border we hover at, but never pass, keeping final order, marking what is present, what is past. You ask me if this love will last more than 10 years when tomorrow is a territory you defend from my interests, massing there, eyeing your industry, your ample fields, your comestibles and ore. What is commerce for but consumption? Yes, I would take all that can be taken and give you all of mine, my flint knife, feathers, few songs, camp with you on that frontier of time. Someday build a, a foundry, forge a metal that doesn't weaken the more it is alloyed. From the crystalline prison of this moment, we would live amidst our imperfect machine, gears nodding, armatures flying, waiting not for its issue or plumbing its past, but feeling instead the wind it makes and the way each night it hums us generously off to sleep. April 20th. Belonging. A man woke up one night to find a python sleeping quietly next to him. The snake was stretched out straight and long from the baseboard to the head, and her breathing was measured and without sound. 
She wants to be your pet, said a man with a soulful dog. She is measuring you, said another, to see if you'll fit inside. <laughs> Snakes are better planners than most people think. <laughs> Feel free to ask Jeff about the origin of that poem. <laughs> The snake responds. <laughs> Indeed, we plan and with flickering tongue imagine everything that is singular and in the world alone as part of us. Of me, I mean, the world truly internalized. It would be insincere to appraise you otherwise you with your limbs akimbo, your random thoughts, even your dreams unbound, never harvested, inattentive not to gather you up into a parcel, gastric and reducible to the simple thought you have always ached to think. You are part of this, just a simple part of this. So this is uh, based on a Theodore Rethke poem. So we're going to sully one more poet with... April 21st? Yeah. Sully... Yeah. We just take them down one after yeah. another. <laughs> None of this is original. We're English majors. Um, uh, so uh, the Rethke piece is, A lovely understandable spirit once entertained you. It will come again. Be still. Wait. And so it came to pass that the light of her mother's regret burned all night, every night, even in the loudest rain. We call such spirits guests, and they do not come unless asked, a table set, some sacrifice of time or livelihood poured at your lonely feet. Be still, lively spirit, at your peril. This is a complex one, April 22nd. It's based on a Goethe quote. You know, we'll, we'll steal from really good poets as well. <laughs> Joyful and sorrowful, longing and anxious is constant anguish, inconstant anguish. Sky high rejoicing, despairing to death, happy alone is the soul that loves. That's Goethe. So we drafted a couple of letters. A couple of letters. And this one says, dear Mr. Goethe, Thank you for your recent correspondence in which you provide reasons for your behavioral extremes. <laughs> we regret to inform you that we were forced to reduce your credit limit to your monthly allotment of ginkgo leaves and apples. The management. Johan, I found the attached note beyond the gate to Ludwigstrasse. It must have blown there. I hope this doesn't mean you'll be late with the rent again. Signed, Herr Koffer. <laughs> we went through a period of this. You can see the next one. Does. <laughs> the next one was inspired by a Kurt Weill song. <laughs> it's in French. Au fond de la Seine, il y a de l'or. Des bateaux, oui, oui, Des bijoux, des armes. Au fond de la Seine, il y a des morts. Au fond de la Seine, il y a des larmes. So we, uh, we wrote back and forth, yeah. commenting upon this. Au fond de la Seine, très, très profonde, il y a des bouteilles et des odeurs plastiques. Il y a des, des boîtes vides de tonnes. Au fond de la Seine, tant de choses uniques. C'est possible d'exister au fond de la Seine à manger le temps et boire des larmes. Et à Noël, on peut voir les lumières profondes dans l'eau sous les ponts. So we're poking fun at, at Kurt Weill. So the first one essentially says, at the bottom of the sand, he's talking about the, the tears in the sand from so many lovers and lamenting this. So we write, um, at the bottom of the, of the Seine River, very, very deep, there are bottles, there is plastic garbage, there are cans of tuna empty uh, at the bottom of the sand. So many unique things. 
And then our, our other one says, it is possible to exist uh, at the base of, at, under, the, under the river, to eat tuna and drink tears. And in, at Christmas time, one can see the lights deep in the water under the bridge. April 24th, fame. He was nice, they all said. We will note his fall. There was a murmur as they filed out of the memory dome, Eurydice saying goodbye, and the rainy cab pulled out. Then pulled up at the river one must not cross if you would return again to this murmuring world, to Eurydice and her aching beauty, waving, waving, waving. April 25th. How can God hold this day and me in the same hand? The birds protest, the mountain groans, wondering how the sky condones this wretched thing upon the land. Forgiving are the rounding stones, the fishes in the slipstream found. My feet upon this simple ground, nothing for this song atones. Alone for a single instant here, locked in the prison of your birth, while still your mind and blood cohere, thistle and thorn on God's good earth. How he despises and forbears your woeful singularity, finds in the paltry words you share no grace nor even clarity. This is not, not a very happy It's not time a good day month. for God. <laughs> God kind of gets it in that one, doesn't he? April 26th, nomad is an island. Our ancestors learned to discern the difference between fresh and spoiled fruit, ripe and fitted, fetid, sour and sweet, and still could stomach the most petru, putrescent, putrescent as necessity required. Why do we retain this capacity and save, savor the plainly insufficient? Take into our innards what we know is drained of promise? How I wish I could disgorge all the twigs and stems of your refusals and be purged of you. Is that about me? Yeah. <laughs> Take you back to the store. On that one. <laughs> Take you back to the store with no receipt and say, I am no one and I have no ID. I took this home one day expecting light and island words with many vowels that hummed onward like a childhood lamp, beckoning the flight of moths, only to have the stock boy look up from his book. You could eat it if you wanted to. Whether it is good for you is not the question. Can I help you out to the car? <laughs> April 27th, I asked the rose how she argued so effectively with the nose. I asked the dog how he hid his deep, damp ambivalence. I asked the swan about her searing eye and they turned and melted into the ground. That smell, that shrug, that look, their vengeful answer. The poorest man is left with his own story, or so we hope, if he has still another poor man left to tell, a pen to write. After that, we fade out, not wishing to imagine the string of consequence that brings us to oblivion or posterity. I had a history once, but those I love struck it from their memories. I recall a beautiful face turned to mine, children, great hope. I remember a day that looked like this day. That was a better day. <laughs> April 28th. Not How time works. It is, it is half past when the ice melts, six minutes before the woman looks away. A scrap of paper remembers that the fourth leaf falls at midnight. A knotted string marks the single wave that smooths your hair, of an em smooths the hair of an empty beach, the softly ticking taste of butter in the marae the dire tolling of your breast in morning sleep. We look at your mother's pictures for undeserved meaning, followed a map to a darkened wall in the words, could it have been otherwise? We wound that watch so tightly, the stem disengaged. It was 20 before or 20 after, always when the hands pointed out dif our different journeys on the same blank face, neither bed or beach, turned the tide. Of all the wheels that wear away the world, this one cut the deepest. I said, you said, I said, you said. 
April 29th. This one is about a dog. And actually, we have started an exchange of, you probably forgot we did this, but we started an, an exchange of dog renga, which um, we should finish sometime. We have about 15 of them. And I think they were inspired by this one. Mm -hmm. Man, dog, man. If the world were not already made, I would make a dog, a creature that took my place as hers and barked like crazy at sounds from outside. I would make a being who looked at me with the penetration and forbearance and sad love that she does. I would make a world of this. The dog speaks. If the world were not already made, I would make a single man, a creature that took my place as his and spoke breathlessly into a thing he carried in his pocket. I would make a being who looked at me with an astonishing selfishness and naked need that I was sent here to meagerly counter with endless love and wish I could sign my name for a plane ticket to sausage land. <laughs> I would make a meal of this. <laughs> See, there's some promise for that dog book. We're going to do that. <laughs> April 30th. They have vegetable things made to look like meat. Why aren't there meat things that look like vegetables? <laughs> if there are veggie burgers, why not steak corn or veal peas? Why do we assume a longing for the flesh despite avowals otherwise? Draw near with faith and take this short rib. Maybe it's <laughs> just what we think people would be in more interesting company that way. <laughs> Come out of that corner and have some lamb squash. You have a lot to offer. Yes, step out here and join the others with blood on their faces. The carrot people can't compete. <laughs> I, I, remember, <laughs> I remember Vincent Price turning over an old woman in Mask of the Red Death. Her face was covered with blood, meat blood. Could it have been beets? I don't think so. <laughs> Either way, a freezer, a freezer can be kind of a time capsule, that's for sure. Reminding us of simpler moments when we warmed up a lump of ice and smiled, look, there is one of those tamales Nina used to like. <laughs> we, we know about mastodons <laughs> and, and certain leafy veg vegetables this way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That was, that was funnier than I remembered it to be. <laughs> so, uh, so this thing really needed to be closed down. So, so uh, the last part of it says, and we know a kind of anger that has the texture of love. This variety works like salt, like osmosis in the corn stalk, drawing what it needs through its bundles, leaving the diner with thirst for more while it leaches essential nutrients from the soul. Steak corn tastes like corn, but feeds the body with protein. Sweet resentment makes the daughter wonder as she looks out the porch. Corn on the hills, cows in the barn. What is wrong with her? Open the book to any page. The ingredients are listed and the recipe follows. Fold the dry into the moist. Do not stir too long. If there is gluten, it will rise. If not, savor the flat bread of your exodus. So that's the end of the 30 days. And there's a wonderful little uh, colophon that Hank added to this. You might read that, because I, I, I like this a lot. So uh, yeah, the colophon is, uh, is what you put at the, the uh, it's, in Greek it means the head, but you put it at the end of a book to, to tell who made it, what it was, why it was made, and uh, it, we probably should have started with this at the head. <laughs> this cycle of poems is written in the manner of call and response, thesis and antithesis between its authors over a sequential period of 30 days. It is printed on St. Armand paper at Limestone Press in St. Petersburg, Florida, and bound by hand in an edition of 100. This is number blank, and then you write the number. Jeff hasn't done that in his books. I never fill that out. No. Because <laughs> if you fill it out and you put like three, people go, why didn't I get number one? Yes. 
<laughs> so I don't bring it up. talk about your process and all about the poems and the way it's come together. Let's start um, with you guys. Anybody from the audience want to ask Hank and Jeff questions? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm fascinated by the idea of fun in creativity. Not just creativity, but everything. Um, while you were doing this, Two things uh, for me to say about that, and then we'll ask Jeff. Um, you know, writing something, making something resolves everything that's going on in your day in a certain way. It organizes it, so it, it, it's not, uh, as, as itself is not the thing you think about, but the process of getting it together does resolve uh, the important things in your mind or the difficulties or the challenges or the hopes. Uh, then uh, the other thing, that I would say about the process is uh, it's labor, uh, especially to do it every every day for for a month and try when to make it meaningful. When you have a regular job, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's so there's that uh, workman, uh, and in your painting you know that. I mean, you don't paint when you're inspired. You paint every day, and that's that's how you get things done. And one thing I have come to realize in, in my life is uh, that I, I used to wait for inspiration to do certain things. And at a certain point, I just realized I am never going to be more ready to do what I need to do than absolutely this moment. And it, it's, uh, that realization is a great liberation. That's a really good thing. He told me that last night, and I was like, wow, that's so true. Um, I think that this exercise, like all creative acts, to me, um, is was born out of a heightened sense of of readiness and perception and to use what you're looking at what you're what's coming at you all day long and in that sense it was really a good prompt you know it made you it made you notice your life all day long because it might be a useful thing in the making of this and and I realized that's the way we should be every day you know I mean and so I, I do I do highly recommend doing this with somebody that you know and love and so on because it actually it makes you notice a lot of stuff and it makes you see the world through their eyes every day as well, which is a really additive thing. Email. Yeah. Very romantic, yeah. No, email. Yeah, nothing very poetic in that exchange. <laughs> well, that's that's something we need to tell you about. When you uh, print a, a book of poetry, immediately you have to think of how you're going to get rid of them. So, uh, since both. Jeff and I draw and paint a little bit. Uh, these things make a really good palette. So we've been, uh, we'll, we'll put them out here for you to, to look at, but um, the paper's nice, it receives color well, so we draw in them. And uh, yeah, so they're, they're images. But we'll, we'll leave the books out. I think one of the great things about this project was the paper that Hank discovered in an example. in Montreal, <laughs> and 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 the paper not only has a feel, and you should come up and touch it. You, you know, you're not going to mess these things up. Come up. I, actually, they're made to look at. So please come up and turn the pages and look at them. Um, they have a sound to them 
which is really unusual for a book. You know, this is, this is a book with a sound, which is amazing. You'll see. Carol. Yes, please. So uh, Jeff admitted oh. to being inspired uh, by Hank's words. And uh, with that inspiration, what did you learn about Hank? <laughs> well, it, you know, I go way back with Hank. And one of the things that's made us good friends is the similarities between us and our approach to life, even though we're different people in different worlds and different parts of the country and different different um, situations. I, I, th I think that like any sort of exercise like this, um, you can't help but you know love the person that you're doing it with more than you did when you started it. Um, what did I specifically find out? I, I mean, I specifically found out that he had certain obsessions in the poetry. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you which ones that those were. But uh, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of meat. That's right. There's a lot of talk about meat versus vegetables. <laughs> but we haven't, uh, I don't think we explained it, uh, that we weren't necessarily reading our own poems. We read them oh, yeah. mechanically. That's and uh, it, they were put in the order that they were created. And sometimes I would send something to Jeff, and he would send something back, and then write the first thing that I would respond to. So uh, we just went through mechanically. I was reading some of his. He was reading some of mine. And we, we there's so if no indication. if you read something really good, it might have been mine. <laughs> 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 Nor in the book did we give any indication, uh, so, and there's no system. So that was just to be fun. That becomes kind of one expression. It's a partnership. And so that actually, Hank, uh, that was just a decision that you made sort of on the fly because of the process in which the poems came in, as opposed to, so I, I read a quote by Man Ray, um, one of the surrealists, who, who said, who, who didn't seem to want to sign his artwork, and said, you know, d no doc, you know, he wants, he wants it all to be just kind of anonymous. And I didn't know if that was influencing your wanting to keep things just sort of secretive about who was actually the author. It wasn't, it wasn't about that. It was more just the process of who, who received the point first and who then responded. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. OK, yeah. okay interesting. Huh. And I, I think because it, it really affects, I think, I mean, it's, because of course the audience, all the way through, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, you're wondering, well, wait, who wrote this? Who wrote that? You know, you kind of, I mean, you kind of approach it as a, as a detective trying to <laughs> you know, put together the pieces of who might um, which is fun and very engaging, actually. But, yeah. Well, I think that in a way, like I said, a lot of this is a, including the poem that you read at the beginning. Um, when you add it all together, it's kind of a collected, exp you know, shared experience of the world at this point in time. And I think we wanted to preserve that feeling mm -hmm. um, yeah. between the two of us. Right. Yeah. It does that, I think. Other questions? Yes, Steph. Aren't you actually the vulnerable one, and I'm the funny one? <laughs> Don't tell them. But I know who's reading Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we definitely push. I mean, it's a, that's that's the fun of it. You're, you're you're challenging, pushing, just to get it done. Also, yeah. I think yeah. One of the fun things about art in general, and you know, you know it when you make art with anybody else or even with you know the art of your children I think is to feel free to do things in front of other people um, and and do silly things sometimes make mistakes and fail I mean one of the big I think great parts of art is it's a place where you can fail and feel safe and you actually learn from the failures like I'm doing tonight. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, is that a prelude to uh, our next? To what we're doing next? Yeah. I know. <laughs> no, but that, that's actually, I think, a very interesting question. Because, um, I mean, did you ever, well, maybe there's enough passage of time in between. Uh, but did you find yourself influenced by, let's say, Hank came back with something lighter um, or something that rhymed? So I'm interested in a couple of the poems that 
that have that really follow fairly strict, yeah. um, both meter and rhyme, mm -hmm. which I have to also say was handled really well. You know, they're beautiful. Um, but but did you find yourselves influenced by what the other might have done, even though it was several days before? Um, I think it's it's kind of tied into what I think you're asking. Um, or or was was each one a brand a brand new you know clean slate? No, I think there was a lot of carryover and also the, the challenge when, when we'd send something in an iambic hexameter yeah. and, and throw it across you know, his windshield yeah. and then he has to throw <laughs> something back. So, yeah. yeah. Interesting. For sure. I, I think a lot of the ones that came from more formal places were inspired by Hank because he's, you know, he's Dr. Hein and I'm not. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> And I do think that more of the goofy ones sometimes happened when I thought we were just getting too damn serious with this stuff. <laughs> but you definitely react to each other, you know, you do. Well, I noticed the ones that rhymed, both rhymed, and, and in both cases, they, they were handled well, doctor or not. They were, they were really well done. So others, other questions? Yes. Hey, Carol. So, I think, you know, and you speak from experience about the collaborative trust in a partnership in art with you and Robert. Um, I think the trust is uh, is the precursor. I mean, you have to feel like you're in a, a, a space that this is going to be productive and want to do it. Any thoughts? Well, I, I think you're very lucky if you have that feeling with somebody. I mean, you know, you don't always have it with everybody. Um, and you're very lucky if you have the impulse to give that to someone else. Mm. But did that influence, for example, why it maybe took a while, like you'd start, and then this was a time when you could do that? Or did you think that that was established earlier? Well, I think the proof is in the pudding. It didn't happen until it happened. However, I think that there was a lot of you know, delivering children to school and things like that that got in the way for now and then, you know? I mean, this was something that you had to do every day. And sometimes, you know, you got up and there was other stuff calling. Um, but amazingly, it doesn't show that much, I don't think. But, <laughs> but I think very seriously, one of the things that I've learned from Jeff is, is how directly he incorporates his his life with his family into not only his private art like this, can we call this private art? We just read them to everybody. <laughs> um, but, but also in, in your professional, it. also in your, uh, in your advertising, you know, the, the humanity that's so attractive in, in your advertising is based in, in that kind of love for your children, what you've learned from them, uh, the whole domestic scene, which is, you know, has to be thought of as productive, can't be thought of as a distraction. Yeah, yeah no, it's true. I, I think that, I, you know, not all artists are like that, but I think that there's a kind of um, appreciation of life that you get if you're lucky enough to have a family and some kids and see the world through their eyes. It gives you lenses on things that are very valuable. And, you know, I mean, you, you see that in, 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 in Dutch art, you know, the celebration of families and, mm -hmm. and dogs and domiciles, you know.
Yeah, if this does that, then it's been great. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Thanks yes, George. In the back. Back here? Yes. Um, in terms of the process, like, was it just one per day that you would work on, or was it like, okay, these are, these are three that I'm working on, and I'm going to choose one and send it over? Because mm. as an artist, you have certain insecurities, you have like certain trajectories that you might go down during the day. Mm-hmm. So are there certain ones that Oh, yeah, I'm sure there were. (laughs) (laughs) I don't don't remember getting very far ahead, frankly. I I don't remember going, I got three now, he's screwed. (laughs) I don't remember that. We don't remember. <laughs> so, the, see, it took, let's see, we did it, we finished printing it about uh, a year ago. It took a year to print. We talked about doing it for about three years, so it had to be like six, seven years ago. Is that right? You're right, it was. I, I, we, could, we could actually figure out what year it was from that. That's right. About that. Yeah. Would you do that for us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, unless there are other questions, I think in the spirit of oh. not being afraid well, to fail. Tim has one. I'd be very interested to know how you would describe your goal, your purpose. When you decided to do this, what were you trying to achieve? How you would articulate I think it was. You know, it was kind of like writing a letter to a friend and having them write back and learning about them, but with a certain formal form sometimes. And I don't think it was much more than that. I don't think I looked ahead to publication. I certainly didn't look ahead to reading it to anybody or drawing pictures with it, which is something Hank suggested. I mean, you have these beautifully printed books. You know, they're, they're gorgeous. And I hope you come up and look at the things that Hank made. And he immediately said to me, you should draw some pictures in them. And I'm like, what? You want to do that to these books? But it turned out to be a lovely thing to do. I mean, defacing the book in yet another way, was, uh, it was great, you know? It was great. Hank, are you just being modest, or do you really want to curtail the questions? Because there may be more. No, no. But we, ha- we have something else we'd like to present to our audience. Yeah, OK, OK. Yeah. yeah, and this is a real treat. And so we, um, unless there's a real burning question to end on, we'll end here with the questions, and then they'll follow with them. Yeah, we'll hang out afterwards. I uh, will hang out to but, take one more one question. One more performance before then. Any, uh, yes, burning? in this yes. process and practice, what did you learn about poetry and the power of art that was new? Oh, wow. Okay, that's a good one. Isn't that the kind of question we could ask the audience? <laughs> Only after you've answered it. <laughs> you have to answer it first. And what, if, then. What, if, what, if, what if we get crickets? <laughs> I, I learned how to emulate Horatio. <laughs> wow. Well, that's good. We brushed up on French a little bit. <laughs> there's a there's, uh, tremendous amount of satisfaction in finishing something and thinking you've done it well. And as Jeff said, the communication was the other side. Stuart, do you have a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if there are no more questions, then you all will end us with another All right, well, what we uh, have decided to do is to create a little symmetry because we had this thing we've called a call and response. Jeff writes a poem, I respond to it but the voices are always separate. So we decided it'd be nice to do something in unison. So we're gonna try something out on you. And, I, and if you don't like it, it gets better as we rehearse it. So come back tomorrow night. <laughs> Free admission tomorrow. 
I don't know what you call this. It's sort of a performance art thing. The art part might drop off as we perform it. <laughs> <laughs> to write, write this, this song, song propels, propels me, me, aligns me. To write, to write this, this song, song for, for God, God above. This call for love defines me. This call for love refines me. This, this call, call for, for love, love refines me. Brother, you, my brother, my brother, my brother, other, other than, than me, other than this song, me. not by blood, blood not, not by, by blood. This, this other, brother, this, this brother, other brother, another, this, this another, brother, together. This call, this call, this call, this call to love defines me. To find these words lines me. We're all together here in entwined. entwined. This, this is, is our song. song. That wasn't supposed to harmonize. It sounded like it did. Together. Sing together. together. To weather. Weather. Forever. The weather. Untethered. The weather. This weather. It is 328 degrees below zero on Neptune tonight. The nearest galaxy is 25,000 light years away. The largest known prime number has 13 million digits. The, te the temperature in deep space is two degrees above absolute zero. There are places with one atom every six inches. We have learned that a few dozen black holes are slowly vacuuming all of us here tonight. Of the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, the human eye can detect only 8%. All we know of the shape of things, all we know of the world through sight is just this fraction. The light we see from the Pleiades was emitted before the first hand drew a bison, before the first burial with flowers, the first song, the first bare human footprint on sand to walk on the longest the brother walk and on all of brother you tonight moving here tonight we are invisible to invisibly the stars. in your chairs your what will time you do? your this time, time fragile time time your how time do you, here how do you how do you follow how do you how? follow how how do you how how do you how do you what how do you what together we, together how do we how did how we, do we start by the heart first we see something in our lives first we see something feel something then something bright. something light we see something drawn light. to it we were drawn to it this drawn call to the light this call this call, call to, to love, love defines, defines me. me. To find these words aligns me. We're all together, all together here, here entwined. entwined. This, this is, is our song. song. This is our song. Walk, Walk in, in life. life. How? How do you? How do you face, face strife? strife? How, do, How you? do you do it? Walk in life. How sister, do you do brother, it? Brother. Walk sister, in life. Brother. Sister. Brothers. Brother. How? Sister. Brother, this call to love. How call? A call this to call love. To this call love. to love. This, this call, call defines this me. This call defines another, me. Call another. Call another. Another. To write this another. song. This call. This call to love defines me. I find these words aligns me. We're, We're all, all together, together here entwined. entwined. This, this is, is our, our song. song. This is our, our song. song. It's like, it's like, so it's like, much. it's like 1962 in Big Sur. <laughs> <laughs> all of you all for coming out. Thank Next you all. program is February 13th. Hope to see you back here. And also, um, come look at these, yeah. If you have time and haven't already, go to um, creativepanels.org. Let's see, I don't know if Margot Hammond might be here or Sheila Crowley, if they're in the audience, but there's a wonderful article about this project um, that you can find on the website. It's terrific. Take a look at it. It's really well done, written by Margot and published and also put forth by uh, Sheila Crowley. So take a look. Thanks again, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Look at these.